All right, by now, guys, you know, I love talking about old wrestling. What you might not know is it's not my real passion. My real passion is helping people save money. My real passion is getting families out of apartments and into houses. My real passion is getting people's finances aligned so they can retire on time. I hated going to Walmart and seeing the greeter being 80 years old. She should not be working. She should be home. Why is she still working? Because she still has a mortgage. I want to help avoid that for you. The other thing I want to help you with, let's make sure your kids don't get saddled with student loans. If you've got a student loan, why did you get one? Maybe because your parents still had a mortgage. I'm not saying that to be funny. I'm being sincere. There's only so much money to go around. What I want to help you do is figure out where you are right now and where you want to be long-term. And I do it at SaveWithConrad.com. I've been doing mortgages for more than 20 years. And during all that time, we've helped tens of thousands of families change their life. I mean, routinely, we're helping our podcast listeners save five, six, seven, eight hundred bucks a month, but more importantly, get them out of debt faster and with cheaper monthly payments. But if you don't think it can happen for you, let me just tell you this. We are not the bank. We don't say no. We say not yet, but here's how. We're going to get you a game plan on how to improve your credit, how to save a little bit of cash and how to get into that dream house. Maybe you're already in the house, but it would be nice if someday we could put a pool in the back or one day we want to upgrade to hardwood floors or remodel the kitchen or get a badass master bathroom. I can help you do all of that with no money out of pocket right now at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket. And if we can't help you save some cash, we won't waste your time. Check it out. SaveWithConrad.com, NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. And hey, y'all, don't take my word for it. Check us out. We've got an A-plus with the Better Business Bureau. And as if that's not enough, go look at our reviews. Read them and weep, haters. ConradReviews.com. You'll see more than a thousand five-star reviews. Our average review is 4.72 stars. Find out how much money you can save. Take control of your life in 2023 by taking control of your finances. We're going to show you how to keep more of your own money. If you've got credit card debt, what are you paying on that? 14%, 28%, you know you can do better. With the mortgage though, you may not know this, the interest you pay is tax deductible. And we can even show you how to skip your next two house payments. So if you can get a lower monthly payment, pay your debt off faster, get a greater tax deduction at the end of the year. And right now, right after the holidays, skip your next two payments. Buddy, this is the biggest no brainer in the history of the world. Find out how much money you can save right now for free at savewithconrad.com. Or hey man, shoot me an email directly. Conrad at savewithconrad.com. Hey guys, need to call a quick time out here. Wanted to tell your listeners what I've been telling my listeners over at OU didn't know for a while now about all the cool things happening over at adsfreeshows.com. An all new mailbag series debuts later this month on ad free shows as we pick the brain of a man who has spent 40 plus years in the wrestling business. Longtime WCW and WWE referee Nick Patrick answers your questions. And Kurt Angle. We can hear on it. Or me? No, no, no. It ended up being my own blood. Austin had had, had the title. It had the jagged edges on it, right? And it had a deal where where uh, uh, Angle pulled me in, and I took a belt shot. A little bonus content comes your way, courtesy of the Kurt Angle Show. A dream match became a reality back in 2016 as Kurt Angle squared off against Cody Rhodes on the Independent. For the first time, Kurt watches back his match against the American Nightmare. This kid's really talented. He's selling the ankle here on the leapfrog, went down on it awkwardly. He's outside the ring talking to the referee. This is, like you said, all part of the match plan. Hey, start to show that weakness in the ankle. Yeah, yeah, this was uh, his idea to you know, make it look like he hurt his ankle so that when he did lose, <laughs> I love he had it. something to gripe about. Ad Free Show members have chatted one on one with AEW stars like Eddie Kingston, Dax Harwood, Ricky Starks, and many more, including a recent live interactive session with Renee Paquette. He still continues to do that. He's on commentary in AEW. Um, so it, I think it was cool for him to kind of put on that analyst hat and get to kind of test out those waters a little bit. But end of the day, it was a thing that I think made him feel like, you know what? Wrestling can be okay again. I can have fun in the wrestling space again. And, and now we have CM Punk Wrestling. So you're welcome. 
That's just a small taste of what we got waiting for you. With four levels to choose from, see for yourself why Ads Free Shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adsfreeshows.com. Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Foley is Pod. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer himself, the hardcore legend, Mr. Mick Foley. Mick, how are you, man? I'm doing good, Conrad. Uh, I want to tell you that I, I have been marveling at the, the type of fortitude we showed. We recorded in a tornado. How about that? Yeah. yeah. So we're I think hardcore. We're, we're hardcore. <laughs> so I think. 25 years from now, we need to do a return, like just call it the night they recorded. <laughs> the night they recorded. This could be a Hallmark movie, right? This uplifting. Damn the torpedoes. <laughs> uh, and you want to talk about uplifting. We, uh, we've had a few of those stories. We had a great episode last week talking about Stephanie McMahon. And yeah. now, a horse of a different color. We're going to be talking about... The controversial, the interesting, the funny, the UWF with your man, Mr. Abrams. Um, you're coming out of WCW. We talked about that earlier in the archives, and you would write this in your book. I met a, na- a man named Herb Abrams at a wrestling convention in New York. It was there that Herb held a press conference and announced the formation of his new Universal Wrestling Federation, or UWF. In addition, he announced Cactus Jack as a signee with the company, which was a handshake deal we had just agreed to. And I think this is actually maybe the very first wrestling convention, right? This is John Arezzi's <clears throat> Weekend of Champions. <clears throat> this is before. There was, it wasn't 120 or 140 people like WrestleCon, but it was Ric Flair. Yes. It was Sting. It was Bruno, Terry Funk, me, <laughs> me. And then, and then uh, uh, kicking off the press conference was B. Brian Blair and uh, Danny Spivey, who got into you know like a scuffle, a little scuffle to get things going, and it was it was pretty exciting. There's a great photo uh, that was on the uh, Dark Side of the Ring uh, documentary of Herb and I shaking hands, uh, and I think he just gave me a UWF shirt to wear. And Herb, he's wearing his jacket down like at Dr. Jerry Buss levels. His shirt, you know, it's like all the way down with the chest hair. It's just a great photo. I, uh, I'm i curious, how does, I mean, do you, you Arezzi books you for the promotion. You made him there, and he says, hey, I'm starting a promotion. Yeah. I'd like to bring you in. And does he just make an offer, or does he say, what's your rate? And then you guys shake I don't answer. even believe I was asking about money. In those days, I mean, I, I got off the in, in the I got off the WCW, uh, I got off the road with WCW, and I set two hundred fifty bucks as my price, and I was getting it. You know, I was pulling in five hundred a week, and so I don't think I would have asked. I mean, if I did, I would have just said to you know the same two fifty. Yeah, there was no contract signing, but he believed in me, and uh, I this is just maybe. Two weeks, three weeks after I left WCW, uh, later on in the summer, um, uh, Joe Petticino's Global Wrestling would come into uh, the picture, or about a year later, they'd come into right. the picture. But yeah, Herb was assembling some talent in rapid fashion, and he talked a big game. He talked about how uh, he thought some uh, he could bring some of that Hollywood glamour to uh, professional wrestling, and... He wasn't lying because he be- if you believe what you're saying, I don't know if technically you're lying. That's the George Costanza rule. <laughs> it's not a lie if I believe it. Well, he believed every word he said, and that belief was uh, infectious. So I'm curious, um, what's the nature of your relationship with the Rezzi in this era? You know what? Uh, this is something that, um, I've pointed a, a multiple times over the years is one of the things that's missing today is uh, where the young men and women get their reps in as far as uh, promos, especially as obviously it's important to get your reps in in the ring also. But when it comes to being a character, 
I would go on John Arezzi's show in character, which I was still trying to figure out, still trying to figure out what Cactus Jack I don't mean to cut was. you off. I just want to explain. John Arezzi had a radio show yeah, yeah. in the Northeast, right. and it was uh, sometimes a quote-unquote shoot, and sometimes it was yeah. in kayfabe. But it was really one of the first wrestling radio shows, yeah. at least in the Northeast. And uh, you would ap- you would make appearances on his program. Now, did you do that while you were in WCW? No, no, I did that, I think, as soon as I left WCW. Okay. And uh, uh, I was living on the island. So you were hearing uh, the show. Yeah, I was, I was hearing the show. I mean, it was a small show. It didn't have enormous uh, uh, coverage, but... It was uh, it was very influential. Wrestling fans went out of their way. To yeah, hear it. they went out of their way to hear it. Um, Paul Heyman was a frequent guest, and so I was on there. And I remember John said, "I said, I want to stand up," and I would do the whole show standing up. I would do the whole show in character, and that kind of segued over to Herb giving me the chance, really for the first time, to cut a lot of promos. Because we were doing all kinds. I don't even know if they made the light of day, but they had a crew there. And one of the instrumental things for me was it was specifically at a UFC show where I realized I no longer felt self-conscious. One of the toughest things, uh, toughest hurdles to overcome is the idea of trying to be on. It's one thing to be on in front of an audience. Another thing to be on in front of a cameraman and a sound guy who have seen, especially in WCW, they've seen it. I want to do a timeout. It. You said UFC. You mean UWF? UWF. That's okay. What, okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. UWF. Um, because there was a UWF in uh, in Japan. There was a Herb Abrams uh, UWF and, and Bill, Bill, Watts. Bill Watts UWF. Yes. So when Bill Watts folded Herb Abrams, yeah, sorry, my apologies to everyone. UFC. I thought you were jumping to the... More common uh, era. No, no, or, no, no. But I was getting the reps in, and uh, that what I was saying is, sound guy, uh, camera guy, <clears throat> camera guy. They've seen it all in WCW. They literally heard ten thousand promos. Yeah. And you're looking there, and the guy's eating a sandwich, and you're trying to get into character. It's difficult to do, and I realized when I—I I don't know for a fact the guy was eating a sandwich. I'm just saying it looks. He wasn't engaged. Yeah, it's really difficult to engage people. So when I realized, wow, I'm I'm becoming able to turn it on even in front of these guys, I'm able to do multiple types of interviews in one you know in one session. That was really valuable experience for me. I mean, as f- much fun as I think we're going to have in this episode. Herb gave me a chance. I mean, he, he donned me with the phrase, the unpredictable Cactus Jack, which had done wonders for Johnny Rods, uh, who's in the WWE Hall yes, of Fame. He the is. unpredictable Johnny Rods. And uh, I came out to Welcome to the Jungle, and it was a chance to learn how to carry myself like something more than a mid card guy. So, going back to Arezzi, you, you start making appearances on his show, and I'm sure he brings up. Uh, hey, Cactus, I've got this weekend of champions idea. Yeah, I'd love yeah. to have you there. Uh, does he give you any sort of indication that Mr. Abrams will be there? I can't remember. Okay. Uh, I'm just curious because I know Mr. Abrams is such a character. I'm curious what reputation he had that you knew of that preceded him, but that doesn't sound as if maybe that was the case. So you just made him effectively cold. Hey, here's a nice guy who's at a Rezzy's thing, and here we go. I believe that was the case. Yeah. Shrewd, as <laughs> Rocky's manager, Mickey, said. Real shrewd deal, a handshake deal, no money. No, yeah. I have no idea of his background. Maybe I had been buzzed. I mean, we're going back. A long uh, time. Yeah, 80, uh, this is over 90, 30 years yeah, ago. over 30 years, so I yeah. can't remember. I wanted to just get to, you know, what were people around you how were they receiving Mr. Abrams? But before we answer that, what was your first impression of the man? <laughs> he was colorful. My wife liked him right away. So my wife was at the convention. Colette and I had met like two weeks earlier. We were inseparable. So uh, Colette had done my hair up a little bit. If you look at a picture, I had like <laughs> some bears. You know, I think you, you have to be a pretty tough guy to pull off that look. Yes, you, you know, do. I was wearing the Pittsburgh police jacket that Brian Hildebrand's dad had given me. Like, I, I had something of a style. I'm not saying it was a good style. 
was something of a style. The teeth had been knocked out, you know, six months earlier. That was a pretty good look, you know. The hair was getting long. And I was, he started to come into my own. Uh, starting to, starting to. We, when it, during the Eddie Gilbert episode, we talked about what a long way I had to go as far yeah. as wrestling as a baby face, but keeping that kind of wild brawling sense. Um, so I was, uh, I, Colette liked him right away. She knew he was a hustler. She could tell that he may have been somebody indulging because my wife had been around that party scene. She knew how to spot somebody. And so she knew he had a habit well, but I, mean, I didn't know. I mean, uh, we're assuming cocaine. I think, yeah, 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 I think it's safe to say. When you name your dog Cokie, yes. yeah, yeah, you've got you've got an issue, right? Well, I, I'm just <laughs> curious when you, because you know, you, we have mentioned before that Miss Collette was a model, and yeah. I, I imagine that that was probably a party drug there. And maybe there are some tales, a sniffing nose or whatever the yeah, case yeah. may be. Uh, but she picked up on those signs. But, yeah, she still liked him. Maybe she there was liked something him. that was charming about him. Well, you couldn't help but not like him. I mean, anyone who's, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, that a portion of our audience, our listening audience, saw Dark Side of the Ring. Yes. And, therefore, they'd like to know more about Mr. Abrams. Uh, he, everyone liked him. Nobody was coming on. Even guys he bounced checks on. Nobody was bad-mouthing him. Like, we're telling stories out of, uh, like, shock and awe, but also out of affection. So my wife liked him. She got a kick out of him. I mean, when we get to his, you know, untimely passing, I have a story to share there. Uh, but, hey, like, Herb was a heck of a karaoke singer. I still remember him singing Teenager in Love, and he was good. He was somebody, he put everything he had into everything he did, even if it was deceiving you. It, he would go to elaborate measures, not just to deceive us, but to deceive himself. Wow. Like, I, on the dawn, on the eve of that disastrous uh, pay-per-view at MGM Grand, which I'm sure we're going to cover, like, Herb believed it was going to be a big freaking deal, you know? Like, and he wanted us to believe it. You know, I didn't get the, he wasn't like, oh, God, we've sold 200 tickets in a 17,000-seat arena. It was Look at this view. Look at these boats. The fans are going to go nuts. That was one of the be best Herb Abrams lines when he, uh, he's, he like summons me and Kurt Henning is up there in the penthouse. So he's got the nicest, got the penthouse suite at the MGM. It's not cheap, boys and girls. How can you not believe in this guy? Yes. And uh, I did not know Kurt very well at that time, but he had just signed Kurt. I mean, he had a deep roster. We're talking about. Sid, you know, Psycho Sid and Steve Williams at the top of that card, Danny Spivey, uh, uh, B. Brian Blair. He had Paul Orndorff there. He had Andre the Giant for a little while. Yeah. Captain Lou Albano. I mean, uh, David San Martin. He had, a, he had a deep roster, and he was pushing some guys, Tony Hom as the Viking, some guys that we hadn't seen before. Uh, and he comes over almost like it's a, cons you know, conspiratorially. He goes, he, he goes, wait till you see what I'm going to be wearing tomorrow night. And he comes over and he shows off his yellow snakeskin boots that say UW, UWF on them. And he says, wait till the fans see this. They're going to go nuts. And I just, I'm just trying to imagine like JR. I don't do a good JR, but like, uh, come on over and take a look at, <laughs> look at these shoes. And if somebody says, hey, how was, how was Mania? And you go, it was okay, it was okay. But did okay. you see oh. Yeah, did you see the shoes on Michael Cole? Right? It was. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. I uh, I can't wait to dig into this. We, uh, we should use a quote from your book here. Herb really felt his new group would instantly join the big two and felt confident that in time it would become number one. When someone at the conference asked if he could feel, how he could feel so sure having about having without having a background in wrestling, Herb replied, "What they're looking for, I have, and that's the Hollywood glitz. glitz. The glitz. That's right. I don't remember him saying that Black Jack Mulligan was going to be his booker. Yeah, that was something. I, I, I honestly, I don't remember that coming. That's out a of famous it. line from the book. We should just add some context there, okay. Mister. Uh, Mr. Mulligan, Mr. Wyndham, he was actually in the penitentiary at the time. Right. So it would have been tough. 
maybe to, to book from prison. I mean, I guess it could be done. Could be done, right? It could but it be might done. be challenging. Yeah. And I think he even announced some stars who were going to be on the roster who, who were no longer passed living. away. Yeah. Uh, so much like Dusty Rhodes before him, we didn't let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> Um, he would also announce that Bruno San Martino is going to be his color commentary, right. and he himself was going to be the play-by-play guy. Right. Yeah. So he thinks he's going to be the next Gordon Soley, but Bruno as a color commentator, that's a big deal. Before there was a Hulk oh, yeah. Hogan, yeah. it was a Bruno territory. I mean, he set all kinds of records in the WWF yeah. in Madison Square Garden. But clearly Bruno had had a falling out with Vince. They mm-hmm. just viewed wrestling much differently. And it was a feather in the cap to get oh, Bruno. Oh, big time. Yeah, yeah, yeah big time. Were, were, you a, were you a Bruno fan growing up? Yes, I was. Like, uh, there was just something about Bruno. Uh, even when he did his comeback matches, like, it, he didn't do that much, but everything he did was done with a commanding presence. So I did. But growing up as a WWF fan, later WWF fan, you didn't get to see Bruno wrestle on TV, unless it was a big angle. You know, the angle was a biscuit. It was very rare you even saw a competitive match uh, when, I, when I was growing up. So you'd have Bruno come out and he would do his market-specific promos, you know, at the time for the, the garden. And I didn't, I didn't go to my first match until 83. Uh, Bruno, I think he was, I think he was part of country, company because he was doing commentary in 86 when I did uh, a few of my legendary enhancement matches but yeah they had a fall vince and uh vince and uh bruno had a falling out and uh herb scooped him up and that was a major get like major when was the first time you met bruno i can't remember would it have been here or before it would have been before that because he was best friends with danucci okay so i would have seen bruno a few times even before 1990 and i saw bruno frequently you know, at least through 2013 when we were inducted into the Hall of Fame, and I think I saw him a few times beyond that. Did you ever have a conversation with him? I mean, a, a lot of times we hear guys talk about sitting under so-and-so's learning tree. As a guy who grew up in the Northeast, were you seeking his advice and his encouragement, or did you ever say, Mr. San Martino, would you mind watching my match uh, no, or anything like that? No, no, no. But, uh, you know, when I heard him talk, it would be like at a lunch with Dominic. Okay. I think he did, came down to the school a couple times. What a great guy to have around you, though, right? And sure. To have in your corner. I remember, you know, I, 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 uh, Bruno was being honored at some wrestling dinner, and I was asked to speak, and I said, I can't get over the fact that Bruno likes me. Yeah. And then when Bruno got up, the first thing he said is, I do like him. I like him. I think he's out of his mind, but I like him, you well, know. <laughs> no lies detected. No lies detected. Um, you write in your book, to know Herb Abrams was to like him and at least be amused by him as he was a true cartoon character. About five foot four-ish with a small frame, Herb realized that he would never make it in the wrestling business he loved so much unless he bought his own company. I don't know where he got his money, but man, did he spend it as he brought in a crew of guys who actually had more talent than the rosters of either of the big two. And I think as the story goes, he made his money uh, through a series of plus size ladies clothing. You're a big girl now, yeah, which is a great name. Yes. Uh, yeah. So he did make his money through that. Um, and he was, oh yeah, he was spending it. How much does it take to bring in, uh, you know, uh, Bruno, how much does Just it to take? to run MGM. Yeah, yeah, to run MGM. I mean, I know he ran out on a lot of bills. That was kind of his pattern there. But, you know, when someone, uh, they believe what they say, they're very influential in the way they say it. Yeah. And uh, he was able to achieve things that someone of his means should not have been able to achieve. Why do you think, I mean, listen, what, you and I have never really talked about this before, but in wrestling, a lot of times people say, oh, it's a carny business. Oh, this guy's a con man, or this guy's a carny. And I know that there are some horror stories, and maybe you have a few of yeah. some shady promoters here or there. But oftentimes, whenever her story is told, that's almost like, okay, he was that but. <laughs> because yeah. people liked him so well. yeah. yeah. And it's almost like we've heard guys who maybe 
had a falling out with ECW or Paul Heyman personally over over their paydays or what have you. Yeah. They would always say the same thing that listen, I would call him and I would be pissed off and then by the time I hung out, I was in a good mood again and ready to go and I'll see you this weekend. Is there some sort of unique quality in a Herb Abrams and a Paul Heyman? They're able to overcome any sort of negative stigma around them. It's really marvelous uh, to think about. The Paul, I, Paul's quite a bit different than... Oh, for sure. Uh, because Paul had the goods to deliver. Yes, he, he knew wrestling. Yeah, Herb, Herb did not. Um, but Herb... He was a dreamer. Right. You know, he was a dreamer. He didn't mean ill, you know, like to accomplish his dream, he had to short a few buildings, you know. He had to tell a few lies, but he was just chasing the dream. Well, I mean, Paul Heyman has done interviews where he talked about, you know, the goal was we had to do whatever it took to keep ECW yeah. alive just one more day. Yeah. Um, and Jeff Jarrett has talked on his podcast that oftentimes as a promoter, you have to be a delusional optimist. And yeah, it feels like Herb kind of checks that box. Well, there are better ways to, you know. It's been, I mean, Robert Fuller said about his uh, brother. He just says better ways to, you know, to just better ways to lose your money than to invest in a, a wrestling company. Yeah, you know, or better ways to make money. But a lot of people lost money when we were talking about Jerry Jarrett uh, two programs ago. I'm sure like when business was bad, when I was there in the eighties, it would have been easier to lock the doors yes. and say, I've done fine. I've done well, you know, you have at it guys. Um, but it was important to run those weekly towns, you know? I mean, I, I really realized as much as I didn't like the small payoffs that it wasn't like there was a lot to draw from. Yeah. It wasn't like you could look at it and say, the place is packed and you know, maybe, you're getting paid off the crowd, and there wasn't much of a crowd, right. but he kept that place going for another several years when it may have not been a moneymaker. Yeah, no doubt. So the talent roster, as you mentioned, is really something. Besides you and Bruno, you've also got Paul Orndorff, Steve Williams, Don Morocco, Bob Wharton, Jimmy Snuka, Sid Vicious, even Andre the Giant. Uh, and somehow, Herb pulls off the, I mean, really the amazing feat of getting a TV deal. Mm -hmm. with Sports Channel. I mean, and I know that it, it felt unrealistic for a long time after WCW went down that anybody could get TV because ECW really struggled, and we know TNA struggled for a long time before they finally got Fox Sports, and then it was a terrible afternoon slot, and eventually they got the spike opportunity. But the the, the barometer for were you going to be a player was getting a TV deal. Yeah, right? yeah you're right. And, of course, I think the world was maybe shocked when Tony Khan came out and started a promotion, and people thought, well, he'll never get TV. And then he did. He wound up with the, Tur he wound up with the Turner organization. But Sports Channel, you know, it's um, trying to be a competitor, trying to grow in the same vein that ESPN did. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we had seen uh, the AWA and World Class and a lot of other programs on ESPN over the years. When you heard he's got Sports Channel – did that change your opinion, and, and or did it just further your belief that hey, this is a real thing? Yeah, just further belief. It didn't yeah. change my opinion because I be, I believed in Herb. I want to point out that Morocco. I forgot to talk about Morocco. Uh, we had a good. I don't know if he went back and watched it now if it would hold up, but at the time, I mean, Morocco's up here. He's the guy that had the snooker match. He came off a nice run with WWE where he was a babyface and very near the top of the card, and. Um, we had uh, anything goes match, and uh, I mean I took it to Morocco. Yeah, and he responded. You know, he responded. We had a good match, but it was like for my self confidence to go out there and to realize I'm gonna I'm gonna work my butt off. You know, I mean I don't know how hard Don's work willing to work, and he did work really hard, but uh, we had a good exciting match partially because we didn't talk about anything beforehand and uh it was it was good and that was another series of you know prog progressions for me because uh, now i'm getting comfortable on the microphone i no longer feel like a, uh, a jerk uh or self-conscious when i'm cutting my promos in front of the sound and uh, uh video guy i'm able to stand up with some of the guys i idolize which is really difficult to do and that's something that a lot of us have to you know in the business you have to eventually 
believe that you belong in that same ring. And then to believe it and be the guy that kind of takes it to Morocco. And I'm not a, I'm not saying there was an element of, uh, you know, com real combat in there. But that's a tricky proposition when you are pushing for the type of match that maybe your opponent doesn't want to have. And you know that in a real-life situation, he could shut you down right. quickly if he wanted to. But he was enjoying himself, and I think he liked the give and take of that type of match. It's, it's got to be awesome to the little kid in you who hitchhiked to see that famous match with him and Snooker, yeah. and now they're in the same organization with you in the same ring, too. Um, the press conference, of course, you mentioned, had a little bit of a, a spat, if you will, yeah. between uh, Brian Blair and Dan Spivey. And you could tell right away that Herb is going to sort of build this thing around him. I mean, he's doing his best Gene Okerlund even at that, at that press conference. Uh, and, and at times people were critical of TNA, saying that it was it was created as a vehicle to uh, be a vanity project for Jeff Jarrett. Right. And then people would be critical of Dixie and say, well, she wants to make herself a star or what have you. But in Herb Abrams' standpoint, like, that's probably pretty close to accurate, he no? He was the star. Yeah, there you go. He was, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the first T-shirt off the press was the Mr. Electricity Herb Abrams t-shirt. And uh, do you want to be the one to, to, to go further into the legend of the Herbie cookie? Oh, yeah, go ahead and tell us about that. <laughs> so, I mean, listen, eventually, you know, they're trying to think like the WWF, think like WCW. Right. Whatever they do, we do. So they're, we're going to need talent, check. Uh, we need um, television, check. Well, we need merch. And as you said... All right, we've got a Mr. Electricity T-shirt, <laughs> not necessarily for the talent, but for him, and now cookies. Yeah, UWF cookies. Tell yeah, us about UWF this. cookies. I wish I had the actual uh, verbiage that we could listen to, but it was Herb as the pitch man, and he's like Doctor Death. You know, I don't know if they had Doctor Death cookies, but there were like three of them that were out. You know, it was uh, Paul Ondorf cookies and. <laughs> I don't, I don't think they had ice a, cream bars in the WWF. Yeah, a so. WWF had ice cream bars. So Herbie's, Herb's coming with the cookies. And he's, he, there's two or three that were already out there Paul Orndorff cookies, the Morocco cookies, and coming soon, Herbie cookies. <laughs> the word, those are two magic words Herbie cookies. Like, yes. not even Vince McMahon had a, a no. Vinny cookie, right? No. No. <laughs> okay, wrestling fans. Here's the latest thing to hit the UWF. Introducing the UWF Superstars Cookies. We've got the Steve Ray Wild Thing Cookie. Our champ's favorite, the Steve Williams Cookie. And besides all that, we've got the Paul Orndorff Cookie. We also have four new kinds coming soon. The Bruno Sammartino, the Lou Albano, and the Herbie cookie. And let's not forget the B. Brian Blair cookie. It's honey flavored. Now you've had the rest. Now try the best. The Universal Wrestling Federation Superstar Cookies. Look for all of them in your local supermarket and UWF arenas around the country. Uh, they run into some problems. They're supposed to have their very first show in Anaheim, and Meltzer writes this. Herb Abrams' UWF was scheduled to begin this past Thursday night in Anaheim, but the show never took place. There have been many different stories about what happened, but apparently there was either a problem with taping the card for television, as far as the owner of the Anaheim Celebrity Theater was concerned, or that the owner simply didn't want a wrestling show in the building after the building manager had booked the show. Both Abrams and San Martino backstage were blaming the problems on Vince McMahon. And while that isn't impossible to believe, it does seem unlikely. At first, we heard the show was to be rescheduled for the next night, but no show took place. We've heard no definite word on a new opening date for the group, although both September 20th or September 25th in Reseda have both been mentioned. So I think you're at this show. Bruno San Martino's there, Nikita Koloff, Lou Albano. Is this the first time you've been at a show and it doesn't happen? Yeah. 
So take me to that day in Anaheim. You know, this is the launch of this new promotion that has TV and all these stars, and now we're not doing it. I, Conrad, I honestly don't remember that exact situation. Sure. I mean, in my mind, we started in Reseda. Okay. I think I was just so taken by Reseda because it was talked about in the Karate Kid. Uh, who could forget? <laughs> was, who could forget? Was, was Daniel from Reseda? Yes. <clears throat> but it was it the country club or am I confusing that with an episode with the with the Karate Kid movie? I thought it was that took place at a place called the Country Club. I okay. could be wrong about that. The, the Reseda Country Club. I don't know. We'll have to review that footage. Uh, but it was in Reseda, so I do not remember. It'll probably come to me as I'm driving driving back home. We can screen Karate Kid as soon as we're finished. <laughs> Uh, Herb originally promoted Hollywood Glitz. Um, there was no such thing in those tapings. Yes. There was not even a hint of glitz. I mean, the idea is these are nightclubs, right? <laughs> yeah. And by the way, I mean, I guess there's nothing wrong with that. We saw a really nice television presentation a few years ago from MLW when they brought that back. They were doing it from a nightclub that they at least dressed up and made look cool for television. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's possible. Um, but Herb has claimed that the show had an advance of a thousand tickets sold for this and like 30 fans showed up, um, to the country club, to the, uh, the original event. Okay. So if you're saying it's the country club, I believe you. Okay. Uh, but it would take until the end of September when they're in Reseda that they have 425 fans there and they have, uh, this is going to be their first television taping. And as we've talked about a couple of weeks ago, those WCW television tapings in this era were marathon shows. Mm -hmm. So he has 21 matches take place here for his television <laughs> taping. And it's reported that B. Brian Blair was going to be booking this thing. Yeah, Was that accurate? What did you think of Brian as a booker? I, I can't tell you that I remember that Brian did the booking. I he, can't. Of course, he's a player. He's there. Yeah, he he's is. He's got Herb's ear. Yeah, for sure. Uh, he was in on the ground floor. I, I man, I hate to be drawn blanks here, but uh, I don't recall that. I don't. I don't recall who I received. I, as far as I was knew, it was Herb who was right. calling all the shots. Uh, so I don't remember who would come and like uh, talk to us about the matches. Right. I, I, I honestly, I was just so intent on having good matches at that time. And I was teamed up with uh, Bob Orton, right? I love that. How cool is that? Like we and we made for a pretty good team. Orton and Cactus were a pretty good team, um, but I, I don't remember who who booked it. We uh, we also know that in that I era, I thought it was Lenny Douge who was one of the bookers. Really? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as time went on, he became the guy. I got you. Yeah. Well, we know that uh, WCW in this era uh, and the WWF, whenever they're doing television tapings, it's more often than not an enhancement match. Right. Uh, well, these matches are usually going to end in a double countout, a double DQ. <laughs> There's only a handful of pinfall victories. Is this just maybe, is he trying something new or is he exposing himself that he's probably in over his head? Uh, well, I think he's trying to assuage yeah. egos. Okay. By not having an, <laughs> yeah, we're going to have competitive matches. We're just not going to have winners but and no losers. But no one wins or losers. Right. Yeah. So, and that was a that was still a big uh, carryover from you know, uh, wrestling lore is that you couldn't lose on TV. To this day, there are still some guys you know who were big stars in the '80s and maybe early '90s, who will uh, warn the the upcoming talent you can't lose on TV. And I'm like. Dude, I lost a lot yeah. everywhere. Yes. And I did okay. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of that uh, sacred cow that probably should have been let go of years earlier. But that was what I guess was at, uh, at hand here is nobody wanted to lose. Well, the uh, story coming out of this taping is something that he does that's maybe a little inside. He has an enhancement talent there <laughs> who calls himself Davey, Davey Meltzer. The, the upset. Davey the Observer Meltzer. <laughs> and he's going to do a job for Dr. Death, who after the match will shove a piece of paper down poor Davey's throat and pour a bottle of dirt on him. <laughs> and, of course, later in the taping, he's going to do the favors for the Black Knight, which is Billy Anderson. And Meltzer would say, for those interested in the background in this, apparently on the day of the show, Abrams had this idea and called Anderson 
who supplied the jobbers to get his smallest, dumpiest looking guy and called him Davy Meltzer. <laughs> the guy who played the role was Adam Michaels, who was in his first pro match and was adamantly against doing it, but to- but sh- told to shut up and take the money. <laughs> Both Abrams and Bruno San Martino were said to have gotten a big kick out of the finish with Williams by those backstage. Goodness gracious. So clearly this is as inside baseball as it gets. We're pouring dirt on him because Dave is a dirt sheet writer right. and <laughs> we're shoving the paper in his throat because it's a rag sheet and a little juvenile, right? Yes. I don't know if it really <laughs> popped the territory. At that point, not people aren't even really familiar with the outside of the underground. Uh, they're not really they don't really know what the observer is, right. right? It wasn't it wasn't mainstream. I mean, Dave was writing the article for the there was a national newspaper at the time, yeah. And uh, so Dave's name was out there, but this seemed it, it wasn't necessarily counterproductive, but it didn't seem to be going anywhere. Guys, I can't wait to talk about today's sponsor. It's Henson Shaving. I've become such a huge fan of Henson. I have to admit, we vet all of our sponsors before they become a sponsor. So they sent me a Henson razor and buddy, I loved it. We've talked about how thin and how tiny those blades are. I was like, man, I can't believe this is real. And I got to tell you, just holding the assembly, the Henson razor in my hand, it just felt quality. It felt old school. It felt like something manly. It felt like something my grandfather, my great grandfather used. It was awesome. And by the way, it gave me the best shave ever. Seriously, I can't even tell you the difference, Uh, but I've been using all the little fancy plastic piece of junk razors down at the grocery store. I didn't think they were junk because they costed a lot, but it wasn't until I was so in love with Henson shaving that I went to buy my dad one. Seriously, I was telling dad about it and he thought, well, how good can it be? And I said, I'm going to get you one. So I went over to the Henson shaving website and I'm almost embarrassed to tell you how affordable it was. I thought this was a great product, but I thought it cost three or four times what it does because it feels like this product will last you a lifetime when it's in your hand. This feels like the last razor I'll ever buy. And considering how many blades I got with it, because they're going to send you a freaking hundred blades. So I thought to myself, self, this has got to be a certain number. It was a third of what I thought it was. Go see for yourself right now. Henson shaving. This is not in the copy. Everything I've told you so far is just from the heart. I'm just being sincere here. Reality is this is not only a better razor. It's also cheaper than what you've been using. Think about that. If it's better and it's cheaper, why wouldn't you do this? You just got to meet Henson shaving. Let me explain. Henson shaving is a family owned aerospace parts manufacturer. These dudes have made stuff for the international space station and Mars Rover. And now they're bringing that same technology and engineering to your face, daddy. Razor blades are like diving boards. The longer the board, the more the wobble, the more the wobble. Well, the more nicks, cuts and scrapes. You see a bad shave isn't really a blade problem. It's an extension problem. And by using aerospace grade CNC machines, Henson makes razors that extend just 0.0013 inches. That's less than the thickness of a human hair. It also means a secure blade and a stable blade with a vibration free shave. By the way, it gets better. The razor has built in channels to evacuate hair and cream, which makes clogging virtually impossible. And here's what I love as a businessman about Henson shaving. They want to make the best razor, not the best razor business. That means no plastic, no subscriptions, no proprietary blades and no planned obsolescence. The Henson razor works with a standard dual edge blade to give you that old school shave with all the benefits of new school tech. And once you own a Henson razor, it's only like, listen up three to $5 a year to replace the blades. I can't believe this is real. It's time to say no to subscriptions and yes to a razor that will last you a lifetime. Go right now. I encourage you. I implore you go to hensonshavingcom slash Foley to pick the razor for you and use code Foley. You'll get two years worth of blades for free with your razor. Just make sure to add them to your cart. That's 100 free blades. When you head to H E N S O N S H A V I N G.com slash Foley and be sure to use code Foley. By the way, if you're curious, I bought my dad copper. He loves it. You'll love yours too. Hensonshaving.com forward slash Foley. 
No, it's, uh, you know, we would see this criticism years later for Vince Russo that he was, quote, unquote, booking for the Internet. This is that before the Internet was around. <laughs> right. uh, here's a recap of your match with David San Martino. Okay. When they present the match on TV, it is overdubbed with almost crowd chatter throughout, and the ring audio is barely heard, so you can't even hear the bumps in the ring. This is to hide the fans cheering for you and the heel and booing of the babyface San Martino. <laughs> As the match starts, they show uh, video and video of Cactus. I would rather hurt a man than love a woman. That's a good line, right? But today, David San Martino, in front of a national television audience, I'm going to have to settle for hurting you. That's not bad, right? That's a great line. That's pretty good. Uh, later, as the match gets going, you send both yourself and David outside with a clothesline. As Bruno yells, "The ma this maniac, he landed harder than David did. But after around 14 minutes, you're sick of the ref telling you to stop beating on David in the quarter, so you just headbutt the ref for the DQ. That's a noble way out, right? <laughs> what a fun finish, headbutting the ref. <laughs> because I was unpredictable. Yes. You can't predict that. Who could have predicted that? What are the Vegas odds on wrestler headbutts? <laughs> headbutts referee. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I've got to get some money on that for <laughs> WrestleMania. Talk to me about the fan in you. You're wrestling a member of wrestling royalty. I mean, this is Bruno San Martino, the Bruno son, and Bruno's on commentary. Yeah. Uh, do you remember anything about the match or about David? Yeah, we, we talk about I, Bruno a lot, but we almost never talk about David. Right. I mean, da I was really lucky that David was on a bunch of the independent shows that I did when I was breaking in with uh, uh, Dominic. Like, you could afford to have one or two stars on the card. And so Dominic was booking guys like Ox Baker, uh, Cowboy Bobby Duncan, and uh, Afa Wild Samoan, and then David was the guy some of the time. Um, and I really, I like David. It surprised me. I, I did a show for Ken Jugan for the School of the Deaf. And uh, David was real short with me. How are you doing? And he was selling his, he was still selling his photos for like the 2 and $3 prices from 1990. And then at a certain point I said, David, do, do we have heat? He goes, to tell you the truth, I wasn't very happy with what you had to say about me in your book. And I said, what did I say? He goes, you're telling me you didn't write it. You didn't say it. I was like, I just, I can't remember what it was. And then I saw a fan with, uh, with, the, uh, with my autobiography, so I looked it up, and I was talking about a guy we had, uh, uh, Dave Crusher Klebanski, and he was like a giant of a man. He was like 6'3", but like 320 and just like big everywhere. Um, and I said that, you know, he, Dave, David Klebanski, like he... he uh, his own, a pro, he had a promising career that was harmed or something by his uh, absolute dedication to, uh, to an adherence to David, and I said, whose own mysterious choices or, or some type of choices uh, sidelined what had been a promising career. And I looked at it, I said, David, this is true. Are you going to try to say you had a lot of promise? And you left territories because, you know, I, but it was a really unpleasant situation, you know, to be confronted like that. And that's not even really a bad. If, and if you can't accept that you had some questionable choices yeah. that may have cost you, you know, your career, then you're not being honest with yourself like right. in, in terms of David. But I liked working with him, and I liked him. I can't say I knew him that well, but we worked several times, uh, uh, independent shows, Herb shows. I think I had two or three matches with David on TV. So I, I liked working with David. After David, next up for you is Davey Meltzer. Did I work with Davey Meltzer? You worked with Davey Meltzer, and uh, you're actually going to start biting at his face. And on commentary, Ooh. Bruno says, maybe you, you eat too early in the day because you're coming <laughs> to the ring hungry. Uh, a few minutes in. Speaking of hungry, did we bring the scale? Oh! Oh! The return. We'll get it. All right, next time One I'm here. One more week of Whataburger. Okay, there we go. Uh, after a few minutes, you get the I win. did go to Whataburger. Did you? Yeah, in the hurricane. Tornado. <laughs> oh, man. oh, my gosh. You drove out of here you in, talk, a you, in a tornado warning. What a gutsy performance it was, too. It was a, what was your order last night? It was, uh, it was a double with cheese, lettuce, tomato, onion, uh, mustard ketchup. There you go. Yeah. 
Uh, you hit the uh, the trademark elbow from the apron, and then throw melts her back in for the pin. Uh, and at the next taping, you get David again, but this time it's a no DQ match, and the crowd goes crazy because you're attacking David before the bell, choking him with your ring jacket. Uh, and later, David kicked you in what Herb called on commentary the butt area. <laughs> the butt area. What a great line. Uh, and you I remember a- one of Herb's calls. It wasn't my match. It was a low blow. And he goes, what a soprano shot that was. Wow. Which is actually not a bad call, right? We, uh, we joked on Tony <laughs> Schiavone's podcast a couple of months ago uh, that you could maybe potentially work in on commentary he hit him in the penis bone <laughs> and he tried to pull it off on dynamite and just got cold feet and couldn't say penis bone on TNT. <laughs> um, you hit a low blow on David. Okay. And the, Bruno's disgusted and he's saying that you should be dis- DQ'd for that. Of course it is a no DQ, a no match. DQ match. <laughs> Later you smash him with a trash can and you get the win after hitting him with a forward object that you take it out of your boot and you're using your feet on the ropes and uh, both Bruno and Herb are appalled at this behavior. Uh, is this where Bruno c- didn't see it? Oh, come on. You mean to tell me? <laughs> My goodness. I, I, look, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the northern way. I don't say bless his heart, but I say I love Bruno. But Yes. Uh, it was pointed out to me that Bruno called wrestling as if he actively did not <laughs> like watching wrestling. I love that. <laughs> he called it. And then he, he didn't like what he was seeing, you know. Yes. Oh, oh, come on. You mean Goodness. to tell me? He's gonna, and I think I took a couple big bumps at one match. He goes, oh, come on. You mean to tell me he's going to get up from this? Like he's like he's writing a review yes. at ringside, right? <laughs> I, um, I do want to ask about the whole baby face thing. I mean, you're clearly here supposed to be a heel. Yeah. I mean, this is the son of a legend. He's supposed to be the baby face. But the crowd is with you. A, it's because this is a smart crowd. Yeah. And you're cool. Uh, you're a cool character and, and do cool stuff, and people want to see more of it. But B, you're playing Guns N' Roses. Like, that's a pretty hot song that was really popular, yeah. Welcome to the Jungle. And people are going to get with that song, are yeah. they not? It was, it was pretty cool. And like I said, I was... Kind of coming into my own. Yeah. And uh, I can't, uh, you've seen the live show where I give so, so much credit to my wife. Yes. You know, Colette really helped me believe in myself, you yes. know, that I was capable of more than I had done in WCW. And that, you know, that really helped me out. And uh, I guess there was a little of that, like, Becky Lynch factor where the crowd is believing I deserve more. In my last, uh, you know, TV, my TV run in WCW, and they're kind of there to support me. And I was fun to watch. Yes, you know, I was, yes. I was. I always believed in interest over heat. Yes, but that, like I was talking about uh, on our last episode about Stephanie. Like, at a, you gain their trust, you bring them in, and then you make them regret ever trusting you because you make the decision to be evil. Right. You have the choice. There's no heat in being the bad seed. Right. right? you make a conscious choice to do the wrong thing when the right thing would be easy to do. Sure. And, uh, and it's tough now because everyone knows the gig. Right. But there's still, I mean, every time a heel has been fun to watch, eventually they're going to get cheered. Right. Well, you also, on the same taping, defeat who they're calling Chief J. Strongbow. He it's wasn't really, a junior? It's Don Giovanni. <laughs> And you're using a foreign object here. This is going to air on November 5th. And they're trying to pretend that this is the Chief J. Strongbow <laughs> and not some ripoff. And now they're no longer sweetening the crowd noise. And you can actually hear loud cactus, yeah. cactus chants. And Herb has to acknowledge it on commentary. And Bruno just can't believe that all these rule breakers are being cheered <laughs> by the fans. But you wrestled a fake Chief J. Strongbow. And a fake Dave Meltzer and Bruno's son. <laughs> this is bizarre. Ah, oh, it was fun. I love it. It was it was fun. That, that fake Chief J, he could really go. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> this sets up an Indian strap match against you and fake Chief J. Uh, but the match never happens, and you end up doing a tag match with Wild Man Jack Armstrong <laughs> against Strongbow and Sam Martino. And your last taping of 1990 <laughs> features Don Morocco debuting to take you on. Um, and you lose by count out to Don Morocco. The match, Meltzer would say, is a bit of a stinker. Oh. As Morocco is the, isn't the Morocco of old anymore, Ooh. and he's much slower. I wonder if this is the one that I was so happy with, because I don't think that one was. Was it at the Penta Hotel or still in L.A.? It doesn't say time? where, but I, here's what I know. The crowd was chanting boring, but you're doing your best to get them back, taking some crazy bumps, even a tombstone to the floor. Mm. But Meltzer okay. would say, although it doesn't look as good as it sounds. So he was just down on Morocco. We know Meltzer was a big fan of yours. But clearly, not really a fan of Morocco. At this point. I would have to. I would. I'd like to think that wasn't the match that I. You know spoke. what? The Penta Hotel was the next month. Okay. 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 So we do the. So that makes sure th there's a DQ. We come back with a no DQ. Okay. Gotcha. So uh, this was taped on January 9th. and just I guess we should remind everybody that was California. Yeah. Now we're running New York. Yeah. So in in the spirit of being a quote unquote territory. This is not that. We're trying to show yeah. that we're a national promotion. You know, I want to just point out, I had a, a few good friends. Uh, it was fun to hang out with Billy Armstrong and his guys, and Jeff Spicoli was one of them. There was a guy named Stefan DeLeon. He was an extra, but he was a heck of a guy, and he was a really good artist, and he was killed in a terrible motorcycle accident. But he was a good buddy of mine, and um, a good guy, a funny guy, and I really enjoyed that camaraderie I had. And we none of us are making much money. I mean, I, I, I guess I was getting my two fifty. Uh, they were getting less, but it was a good, it was a good group of guys. Billy Anderson was a good guy. I mean, Jack, Wild Man Jack Armstrong was a good guy, and I was starting to feel like I belonged. You know, like I was kind of becoming a little bit of a leader in the dressing room. Uh, so I I did enjoy myself. I just want to mention that because I think uh, Dave had written about Stefan's uh, passing. Years ago, but yeah. he was a good guy. He was a really good guy, nice guy, and um, you know, missed by everyone who uh, knew him. Glad to hear it. Um, so let's talk about this taping here at the Penta Hotel. It's taped on January 9th. It airs on January 21st. You defeat Mike Williams by count out after that big elbow from the apron, and the crowd is super hot for you. You're easily getting. The biggest reaction from this first. This New is York New York, taping. yeah, yes. yeah. And Mike Williams, I think, was a tag team partner Johnny Grunge at that okay. time, and they were a good tag team. You also wrestle uh, Sandy Beach, yeah. Uh, and um, there's some shows canceled in Queens on this same loop. Once, listen, that first show getting canceled, obviously that was less than ideal. But now, when you're saying that shows are getting canceled in the in Queens, are are you just taking this every day as it goes? Are you losing any faith or confidence, or is this just part of the wrestling business? <sighs> Trying to think back to the canceled shows, because I was also having a nice little indie feud with Sandy, who uh, I knew better as Sunny Beach, and uh, uh, Herb teamed him up with uh, Wild Things TV Ray to be wet and wild. But I was having some good matches. I really, you know, some good bloody matches too on the indies. Uh, so my stock was actually rising in the wrestling world even yes. before I really got deep into the feud with Eddie Gilbert. But again, it's all, it feels like it's coming together for me. So uh, if there was a canceled show, show I, was, I would just roll with the blows. Here's something from The Observer. Many of Abrams' checks for the New York City tour bounced. Abrams has made good in cash as of Sunday for most, but not all of the money stemming from the bad checks. Abrams is all tied up in legal problems with Vince McMahon as well and spending much of his money fighting legal fights, which may be why money is so tight right now. Plus, there is no real source of income coming in. The check to the Royce Hotel also bounced, so the February 8th show there is off although Abrams was going to cancel anyway. John Arezzi, who helped promote the shows on the last tour, was offered the chance to stay on, but only on a commission rather than a salary deal, and declined, so he won't be promoting the shows. So you could tell that Arezzi was thinking, man, this could be a chance to do something pretty cool, mm -hmm. and he says, all right, that's enough. Yeah. Uh, at the end of February, 
Herb runs a four-hour TV taping at the Penta Hotel in New York. There's 500 fans here, and uh, there's less talent here, maybe because of the bounce checks. Was this something guys were talking about in the locker I room? I think so. I mean, you're seeing that they can't afford to bring people in. Right. I, I don't know how many guys were flying first class, but I have to believe like guys like Orndorff and Steve Williams were flying. And I have to think they were. Right. I wasn't. I mean, I wouldn't get that privilege to like 99. Wow. Yeah, it'd be Maybe a long. Champ. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, but we're still making do, and I'm – I'm not saying I had blinders on uh, because I was aware there were some issues, but uh, man, I don't, and I don't want to keep reiterating this, but I was just so glad to be growing. Yes. You know, I mean, yes. like I said, I was pulling in almost $500 a week. I have got this great uh, love thing going on, you know, Colette it's and a I. Good are, time yeah, we're life. moving into our first apartment together. I'm getting some buzz. I believe that I'm going to get going to get back to WCW. Maybe I'm going to get back to WCW one day and make that 1500 a week again. You know, I'm I'm feeling pretty good about the future. You wind up being managed here uh, by John Tolos. Yeah, the uh, Golden Greek before. Wait, he was go. or was that Spiros Arian? Uh, John, Co they called him Coach John Tolos. Yes, this is before he manages Mr. Perfect okay. in the WWF. Uh, and you get another match on that show with Don Morocco. This is the one that's a brawl all over the building, and Meltzer loved it. Okay. Called it a great brawl. Um, Meltzer would say, UWF drew 400 for the Penta Hotel on March 10th, told it was a very hardcore and unruly crowd, and that there were frequent chants of UWF sucks and the like. <laughs> told it with the exception of Cactus Shack, the card itself was pretty bad. <laughs> Uh, which is what people have said in the past. Fans apparently got more and more upset with every screw job finish, which took place in every match with the name stars. It's, you know, placating those egos at the expense of your fans. Not good for the long-term business. Huh? No, yeah. no. But at this point, the only thing I would have taken from that show was that I had that post-match buzz because I'd, you know, gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Morocco. We'd had a really good match. I think on this show is your first chance to work with Paul Orndorff. Does that sound right? I think I I, I may have had a couple of indie matches okay. with Paul. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, you also team with Bob Orton and have a double DQ against Sandy Beach and Steve Ray, and you and Terry Gordy would attack Paul Orndorff in a cage match. Lots of DQs all over the place here as well. What was Terry Gordy like here? Try to think, uh, what do we have a, uh, a, a month and a date for this taping? This would be March. March. So, the March of 91? Yes. This is, I can't remember. This is before or after I did my tour for Baba. Okay. Uh, Terry Gordy gave me, he bought a set of external speakers for his uh, Walkman in Japan. They were like two years ahead of us when technology, you'd see things in Japan in the stores that we wouldn't see in the States for a couple of years. So when Terry got those new speakers, he gave me his old speakers to be gifted speakers by Terry Gordy. That's pretty cool. And he was such a laid back g guy. He was a cool guy, one of the best workers in the world at that time. Uh, I, so I can't remember if I was getting to know Gordy or if this was after the uh, the tour where I, I had already Got to know him a little bit. That's pretty cool. So listen, there's a little bit of controversy. Every now and again, there's uh, indie issues. We got one here, and I want to let Meltzer sort of recap it. The biggest story actually occurred before the show. Apparently, Cactus Jack, Paul Orndorff, and Bam Bigelow had all informed Abrams before the show. They were already booked that night for Joel Goodhart in Philadelphia, and Abrams said he was starting the show at 7 p.m. and would put them on early so they could make their Philly date. But the show didn't start until nearly 8, and Orndorff and Jack both left and had words with Abrams, and right now their future in the UWF is in some doubt. Ooh. One of the semifinals of the UWF television title tournament was supposed to be Bigelow versus Cactus, but by that point, Cactus was already en route to Philly, and they announced that Cactus Jack no-showed and gave it to Bigelow <laughs> on a forfeit. What in the world happened here? This is where you get the famous uh, Brody method of walking around the crowd so they know that you're there before you leave. Um, man, uh, you see, I'm all smiles about Herb. Yes. Now, because I, you know, I choose to remember the, the good times. The good times, and they were almost all good. 
I, I now you're saying it does come alive. Me and Paul Orndor are pulling together because I always took that real seriously. When my name's on the line, I, you know, on the dotted line, I'm, I'm going to be there. So just jumping ahead to 99 when, or maybe it's 98 when my wife and I and the uh, Dewey and Noel are living in the Florida Panhandle, we're getting a pool put in. And the guy is continuously late, you know, he's running into overages. And when I finally say something to the guy, Gold's Pools, I don't want to uh, besmirch the good name of Earl Gold, but uh, uh, he goes, hey, what can you do? If your workers aren't there, you can't get the job done. I mean, your car breaks down, you can't make it to the show. And I go, oh, no, that's where you're wrong. Because when my car breaks down, I take the license plate off, and I stick my thumb out, and I make it to that show. And that happened to me in Sunny Beach. We were driving. I had Mike, uh, Maniac Mike Davis's, uh, I think it was a 1980 Plymouth Arrow, and it breaks down, and uh, I just get the screwdriver that all the wrestlers had. I take the license plate off, out goes the thumb, never see the car again, and we make it to the show. Wow. So I took that stuff really seriously, like most wrestlers do. And uh, I don't want to know, sh I don't want... I don't want to leave Herb's show, but he at that point had breaking a, broken a, a verbal promise to me yes. and Paul, and boom, out we went. Guys, by now you've heard about Blue Chew on our program for a long time. Mick and I are big believers in Blue Chew, and we want you to try it. Sincerely, this isn't just for guys who have a <clears throat> problem. This is for guys who are trying to leave a lasting impression, for guys who want to enhance their experience. Think about it as PEDs for your PENIS. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredient as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, y'all, day or night. So plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. And the process is simple, guys. It's three steps. Number one, you sign up at bluechew.com. Number two, you'll consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, number three, you'll receive your prescription in just a few days. Blue Chew's tablets are made here in the USA. They're prepared to ship directly to your door. And by the way, it's in a discreet package, so don't worry about the mailman knowing your business, okay? The best part, it's all done online. That means you get to skip the awkward conversations. You don't even have to go to the doctor's office. There's no waiting in line at the pharmacy. It doesn't get any easier than this. And I've never recommended Blue Chew to someone, and they came back and said, oh, it didn't work. Everybody's like, hey, man, uh, thanks for the pro tip. So if you can benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, chew it and do it, y'all. Let's have some better sex, shall we? And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free and use our promo code Foley at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com. The promo code is Foley to receive your first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. We thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. So uh, you're, not a, you're not a part of what... Meltzer called the least successful pay-per-view show in pro wrestling history. I thought I was there, the one in Florida. Oh, and I'm sorry. Because it uh, was me and uh, Cowboy you, Bob. You, you weren't done with the company is what I meant to okay, say. Yes. In that a lot of people would have assumed after you quote-unquote no-showed, that's it for him in this territory. Right. But that's not the case. So I guess the question is, after you, you do this walkout circumstance, how do you mend fences with him? Does he call and try to book you again, or do you um, call him? You know, I can't remember. I do think the Pettacino thing was coming into play at this point. Okay. And Joe supposedly had, you know, a Nigerian backer. I don't know if Joe answered the uh, the, <laughs> the letter from the Nigerian prince. Uh, it didn't turn out to be as much money as he thought, but J they did run a, a promotion for a while. Like They, they were a viable... Promotion. I think I made the call when I heard they were coming to the Penta, and uh, Herb said, "Well, we've already got the budget in," and I did volunteer to work for almost nothing. Um, and then I do think he he bragged about that. You know, I got him for fifty bucks, and I didn't think he needed to do that. Yeah, that's not cool. Um, because I, I I believe my name may have already been advertised. I didn't want to no show. I, I, I don't remember that for a fact, but I do believe I was the one that reached out to Herb and okay. said I wanted to be on the taping. Well, here we go. Beach Brawl, June 9th, 1991, the Manatee Civic Center, Palmetto, Florida, Wet and Wild, taking on Cactus Jack and Bob Orton. It was like three minutes. 
That's exactly right. Four <laughs> minutes. John Tolos is going to be your manager, and he's going to throw a gimmick down from his cage to Orton, who <laughs> accidentally punches you, and then you're pinned. You guys are going to argue and then make up. And when Jack turns his back on Orton, he was jumped, and the two brawled to the back with Jack juicing heavily. Oh, I did. Star in three quarters. <laughs> so you're bleeding after the match on your way to the back. Were you just like, I got to do something. It's pay-per-view. Oh, man. Well, I probably would have been looking forward to the idea of working with Cowboy Bob, I, although I don't recall we ever did work singles matches. Right. Um, I do remember, like, they were insistent that it be brief. And I, I was thinking of that match when I got into my car, uh, rental car, and it was smoky. Because you hate to get hit with the penalty for some what somebody else does. Right. You know, I've never smoked, never will. Uh, and I do remember like having to pay $450 for a cigarette burn when I knew full well that nobody was smoking in the rental car. Right. So I got paid like, maybe I got paid 500 at that time for the pay-per-view. And I think the first check did clear. Uh, or I still may have been on the two two fifty, uh, two hundred fifty, maybe two hundred fifty dollars. It was not lucrative, right? I may, suffice to say, I paid more in that car rental penalty than I made for that pay per view show. Uh, the main event of that show is Doctor Death beating Bam Bam to become the first ever UWF champion. And next up is what you alluded to earlier: the blackjack brawl at the MGM Grand Hotel Casino. <laughs> um, man. How do you think Herb lands this deal? I mean, this is an expensive thing. He talks the talk. Yeah. I don't know. You know, like when I go out uh, for years, it was like my annual Los Angeles vacation where Barry Bloom would bring me a viable project for me to star in. You know, I was like, Barry, can't someone just write me in as the offbeat neighbor on a show that already exists? Right. Instead, like they're writing shows for me with real producers, and I'm going in to talk to, you know, the, the main people at all the networks, and it's, the presentation is almost everything. And if you believe in the project, you get people listening and taking those notes. And I was always pretty good in the room. You know, if you ever talked to Barry, I was pretty good at making these things come alive, even in cases where I didn't really believe in the project. But you could sell it. I could, I could help sell it, and we got a, you know, one thing to script, another thing was picked up, you know. Uh, but until Holy Foley, nothing actually came to fruition. I did a, uh, uh, we did a pilot for for A and E, you know, uh, wrestling my family, you know, uh, not to be confused with Paige's movie, right? right which I think was fighting my family. Uh, but I'm just making the point that the presentation is so important, and Herb Abrams believed he's not lying. It's not a lie if you believe it, That's as George right. Costanza said. And I believe he was just able to talk his way into these prestigious buildings. Well, he couldn't talk any fans in. <laughs> 200 fans here in a 22,000 seater. Yeah, I made a mistake. I said 17,000. It was 22,000. MGM is one of the biggest indoor arenas. You're, you know, other oh, outside of a stadium. Yeah. yeah, it's just immense. You wrote this. I think that it was at the MGM show that Herb's announcing skills really came to the <laughs> forefront. That's what he taught. He wrote about him showing you the big surprise. The big surprise, the unveiling of the boots. <laughs> so this is, and I think hadn't Herb like gotten into not a scuffle, but like a little wrestling match with uh, Mister Perfect. And Herb, whatever the case was, Herb had a big sore or <laughs> bruise or blister on his lip. He's drinking heavily <laughs> during his own show, <laughs> and when Mister, who is it was. Who won the um, uh, Little Tokyo? Little won. Tokyo had just won the prestigious <laughs> Midgets World title. And, so, and Herb slurs. Go can ahead. I say it? Yes. <laughs> he goes, uh, maybe you have some sake tonight. And Little Tokyo goes, how, how do you know sake? And Herb goes, I was married to a Jap once. <laughs> <laughs> this is unbelievable. <laughs> this is, this on, is a story like no other in wrestling. This is on live TV. Uh, it's just... Uh, everything that could go wrong is yeah. going wrong. And earlier in the day, he has told me a few hours earlier that I'm going over against my idol, Jimmy Snuka. This is the right. first time I'm wrestling Snuka, maybe the only time. And he assigns me the task of telling Jimmy. 
So I go, and Jimmy's playing the slots, and I said, oh, Jimmy, uh, Herb would uh, like you to put me over. And he goes, ah, brother, I think what you're telling me. And after about a minute, I said, double DQ, and he goes, beautiful. So it's a lumberjack match. Which, the, by the way, you say you start having to recruit lumberjacks. Yeah. Because no one considered that, hey, we're going to need, we've promoted it as a lumberjack match, but there's no one there to do it. <laughs> so you get two male wrestlers, yeah. two female wrestlers, two little people, <laughs> and three security guards. <laughs> this is the most group of ragtag lumberjacks. <laughs> That's the worst. In lumber wrestling history. This is a pay per view <laughs> at the MGM Grand, and yeah. one of the talent. Is trying to say, can you do it to a little person? I can <laughs> because just a lot of the guys are saying no. You know, but Tony Hall, a lumberjack now. Yeah. You're 287 pounds yeah, or whatever yeah. you build at, <laughs> and a little person is supposed to throw you back in, <laughs> yes. or a lady. Right, it's unbelievable. And when we start fighting out of the crowd, you know, Brian Blair agreed to do it. We start fighting out in the crowd. We're in like the sixth or seventh row, and Brian Blair, I can't, I probably say. You're right. That he comes over and says, What are you guys doing? As he gave Chase into the 27th row. You 27th rose. row. It's a double count out, I yell. <laughs> I'm yelling it. As you're trading yelling punches. It. <laughs> and he says, You can't do that in a lumberjack match. And my answer is, It's a herb show. We can do whatever we want, right? Was that the yes. exact quote? Yes. <laughs> Just here, I, 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 it's a lumberjack match. Two, just everything you, two hundred people. Yes. In a twenty-two thousand seat building with little person lumberjacks. Uh, little person lumberjacks. I am wrestling my idol. We're in the twenty-sixth to twenty-seventh row. <laughs> this is still in the age of kayfabe. But when Brian says, "What are you doing?" I yell out, "It's a double D." You're yelling the finish. <laughs> Yelling the finish. And he's just befuddled. Brian's like, a, you know, Brian was a Old county commissioner. Like, he's a, you know, details guy. Buttoned up. Uh, and so there is the entire purpose for a lumberjack match is so that there not be a, a count it, out. It stays or, in the ring. Stays in the ring. And it, it's a double DQ. He goes, you, it's a lumberjack match. You can't do that. It's a herb show. I'm literally slugging it out, stuck a yelling out. It's a herb show. We can do whatever we want. And uh, my recollection, what uh, did we get two stars out of this? I don't even think we need to discuss it. <laughs> um, what's your lasting memory of herb and your time in the UWF? Well, Fun. look, I've been smiling and laughing the, the entire whole, time. Yeah, the whole time. Yeah, I mean, great fondness. I mean, we're on the um, ah. Uh, and then I got I I ended up there's a nice uh, hook here because we had the you and I talked yesterday and we went off the or you know we we're very honest with our uh, uh, viewers and listeners yes. and we appreciate appreciate all of you I haven't said this in a couple months but we know there are a lot of choices yes. out there and we really appreciate you uh, choosing uh, choosing this show yes um, so we record three of these in in two days yes. And um, we were talking, <laughs> to remind me what we were talking about. I was about. asking about your time with UWF. Oh, yeah, yeah. Fondly. So, you so yesterday you and I were talking it. about the, uh, the question posed to me at the end of uh, uh, Dark Side of the Ring. Oh, it's uh, such a great line. If Herb Abrams was What's still here today, here, what do you think he'd be doing? What would he be doing? And I paused and I said, time. <laughs> it's the wittiest one word answer perhaps yeah. in the history of wrestling. <laughs> and then they did this great job where as I continued talking saying look he wouldn't have hurt anybody except himself but he probably would have, there would have been a test somewhere along the line his past would have caught up with him I said we would be toasting with a glass of milk dunking in our Herbie cookies and they do this great simulation of what that meeting might have looked like. And you can just tell the fondness. Through the bars of a jail. Through the bars of a jail. Yes. I mean, maybe B. Brian Blair had maybe an even better line. I loved it. A, he, he went out how he... A doing what he, he loved, loved. Hookers and cocaine. Yes. You know? <laughs> so listen, uh, this is a, a mostly family show, even though we do have Phantom Ball appearances every now and again. But... There was a lot in the dark side that 
uh, in that episode where guys saw him consuming cocaine. Did you ever see him consume no, cocaine? No, no. I wasn't in those circles. You're not the party scene. Nobody would have invited me to see that. Um, well, allegedly, once upon a time, you uh, did have an eye for the ladies. Me? We, yeah. Oh, pre clet Well, you were a fan of them. But what did that have to do with... Well, I'm just the, wondering, when you're going to his suite or to visit him here or there... Were there some of those interesting no, ladies No, uh, there around? were no ladies there. That was just me and uh, Kurt and uh, Herb. Some of uh, the guys in those documentaries, as I'm sure you've seen, have heard that they'd go up to his room and he would have lines and these ladies hanging out. And yeah. Maybe covering himself in Vaseline. Like, well, that wasn't until he passed away. Okay. I don't know if that was a go-to in the Herb Abram playbook, but this is where I'll take you to the moment. I read it in The Observer. Um I say to my, I mean, I still remember, it's in our bedroom in our old house in Ackworth, Georgia, and I said, oh man, Herb, Herb Abrams passed away. And Colette says, oh, how? And I start reading it, and I'm really down, you know, because I liked Herb. And I said, it said um, he was covered in baby oil, and he was chasing some prostitutes <laughs> with a baseball bat. <laughs> I just... Start laughing. <laughs> what are you supposed to do? <laughs> to do like, if you've got to go, this goes back to uh, Liam Neeson, or or no, it wasn't Liam Neeson. It was one of the actors in the original uh, Airplane, where he's like, oh, that's no way to go. Get your nuts caught in a gear shifter. That's the way. <laughs> like they're comparing ways to go. Right, you know? right. <laughs> Get your, and it's like, if you've got to go, and now I'm flirting to Legends of the Fall, where right. uh, Brad Pitt's character, it was a good death because he got mauled by a, a grizzly bear. Right. It was like her baby rooms covered with baby oil, <laughs> chasing hookers. With a baseball you wrote bat. in your book a it while was later. A good death. I read of Herb's passing in a wrestling newsletter. I assume it's the Observer. Yeah, I think so. I called over Colette, who had gotten to know Herb pretty well, and began reading the article. I couldn't get through it without laughing in spite of myself. <laughs> Like his life, Herb Abrams' death had been way over the top. Apparently, someone had alerted police to a disturbance in a high-rise office in Manhattan. When they got there, they found women screaming in the hallway and little Herb running around naked, bathed in baby oil, swinging a baseball bat in which he was destroying furniture. He was taken into custody and died shortly after from a massive heart attack. Collette and I sat down and mourned Herb's death by sharing stories of his life and laughing at what a character he had been. I think Herb would have liked it that way. I think way. he would have liked it that way, right? Can you imagine uh, Herb, God rest his soul, if he knew that we'd be talking about him 30 years. He would love it this so is much. 33 years yeah. after the fact, and we're talking about him. Yes. Yeah, what a, and look, the, the bookend here is that I, I found this fabulous um, baker, <laughs> March, March is the name, M A R. Jay, and she made these amazing, she made the Foley uh, gingerbread cookies. Yeah. We loved them so much. We had them made. And uh, Grillo, we'll have to throw this up there. I'll, I'll get you a photo of what all the Foley's look like. She, in addition to the gingerbread, she made them like to look like gingerbread so they could stay and be ornaments. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, and so I asked her if she could make some Herbie cookies. So she actually, she made cookies and ornaments and I gave them to, uh, I gave one to uh, uh, John Arizzi. I gave one to Sunny Beach. I gave one to Evan from Dark Side of the Ring. And I kept one. So there was, uh, there was a, I believe, a herb body, you know, and he had the frosted hair and the chest hair. Uh, Did there, he have the boots? He, he, there was a separate cookie boot, uh, boot cookie, and the there was a Cokie the dog. You know, when... When in the telling of the story on Dark Side of the Ring, like they've already ascertained that he had this issue with yes. the, the powder, and so when Sunny Beach says, and he doesn't mean it to be a joke, he said, "Yeah, I, uh, I uh, adopted Herb's dog," and I think he's asked on camera what was the name of the dog. <laughs> it's a white dog. 
Coke. Of course it is. <laughs> Dan Coke. Of course it is. <laughs> so, Mick, was this your first time trying cocaine here in the UWF? Uh, what? what? Well, <laughs> no. I just thought it was a prerequisite to no. work there. No, I never tried it. Never will. I'm really proud of that. To get away... To be in the wrestling business in the 80s and be the guy that it never tried it. I will tell you there was a story. And I, I, don't, I, I think Michael Hayes has been on the record about yeah. you know the debauchery that took place. He's telling a story at the uh, Turner Center where about, you know, like the four or five people who'd be next to do their market-specific promos would be in that uh, little green room. And he's telling a story about the old days. And I'm laughing along. And Michael turns to me and goes, I can tell by the way you're laughing, you have no idea what we're talking about. Is it absolutely not? Absolutely no idea what this drug does because I never touched it. Well, was this uh, Blackjack Brawl, the Vegas show, was that your last time working with UWF? <sighs> I think it was. I think Herb gave me a check. Maybe he hadn't signed it. I can't remember what, but it w was not cashable. Okay. We're not depositable. You think he didn't um, sign it because you didn't? I don't think he signed anybody. Rules? I don't think he signed anybody's check. Of course not. I think that was including a, MGMs. I don't think uh, they got paid. Ah, no, I don't think they got paid either. Yeah. Oh man. Well, what a great. He was a great guy. Was you, that the last time you talked to him? I I don't know. Okay. I don't know, Conrad. I don't. Know. And I may have been angry for About a little while because I believe that was to go all the way out to Vegas, and you know, I was too, you know. 275 or whatever at the time and you're scrunched up in uh and i was a legit 6'4 so you're scrunched up the, the knee you know the every time someone would lean their chair back the magazine rack is digging into your knees um so i think i demanded 500 for that show and then 500 and got nothing uh good good i wrestled snooker yeah i've got some funny stories to tell uh we're conceivably making some money on this program so it, yeah in theory we'll make more uh, in on theory the show i'll today. make more on this show than, than i made working for for herb in uh, in all the time i worked for him uh instagram a wrestling historian wants to know why were abram's cookies so good to eat were they actually good i don't know if i actually tried them he said coming soon herbie okay. cookies uh, I, I can't tell you that I actually ever tried a, a cookie. Uh, Adam Leeson says, what's a Herb story that Mick heard that sounded too insane to be true even for him? No such thing. Okay. No limit. You know, that, look, I heard that uh, one of the guys told me that uh, Herb was visited by a couple of the, uh, the working women, and he wrote them checks, and as soon as they left the room, he called up the bank. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, didn't Jerry Springer do that? Didn't he write a check <laughs> to a lady back in the day? I don't, I don't know. I think when he was in politics in Ohio, mm. they caught him because he wrote a lady a check. Possibly. Which is like, you would think you would know better. Yeah. Hypothetically. I, and, as an elected official. Right. Um, so there's one that I, I can't, I can't prove its accuracy. <laughs> Certainly sounds like it could have happened. Um, but, but that might be too much even for her because I, I don't know if the working women were accepting personal checks. Well, I was going to say like, I mean, I don't know if we even, do they do that on Craigslist anymore? I know some <laughs> ladies go, but like, could we call one and be like, do you take a check? Like maybe they've got a scanner now. I don't know. Maybe they got they square. They swipe your <laughs> <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> What is going on with us? <laughs> Jay the K wants to know, was there any homegrown UWF talent that you thought had potential? Well, he was pushing uh, Wild Things, Stevie Ray and uh, Sonny. And, Sonny. and Stevie Ray, you know, he had a lot of charisma. He rubbed a, a lot of people the wrong way. But I remember him getting a, a WCW tryout, and he was he had like a sleeper hold on someone, and while he w had the sleeper, he was waving like, Bye bye, like good night. And he was looking around, and Arn Anderson just casually goes, "I want what he's on." <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> so I think those are two guys that he was pushing. He was pushing Tony Hom as the Viking before he went to New Japan and uh, WWE as Ludwig Borga. And he was pushing me. I mean, I was, I had six months of being a mid-card guy who was mostly known for losing matches right. in WCW. And he allowed me like a taste at the top of the card. 
And so I, it was a combination of things that helped me during that period. I'd say first and foremost, the Eddie Gilbert feud, right. along with my wife's uh, belief in me. Yes. And then it was the reps I was getting in. It was a commitment to hard work. But Herb giving me a push on a national promotion, uh, that was a that played a role. It was a it was a good role. Like I didn't make a lot of money there, uh, but I've got some stories to tell, right. and uh, and I learned a lot, and I grew. I want to remind you that in my real life, I'm helping people keep more of their own money at SaveWithConrad.com. I would love to see if I can help your family save some cash. We're routinely helping our podcast listeners save thousands of dollars each and every year all because they spent just a few minutes with us over at SaveWithConrad.com. I'm talking to you if you're in a 30 year loan, I'm talking to you if you've got credit card debt, I'm talking to you if you've got a second mortgage, we can take care of all that. Just like that. We're going to get you a better interest rate. We're going to shorten your term and we're going to help you pay off all your credit card debt once and for all and do it all with cheaper monthly payments. That's right. You can get out of debt faster with cheaper monthly payments and you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to do it. Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. And here's the thing, man. There's a chance that you've got a great deal. Maybe we couldn't save you any money, but wouldn't it be nice to just have that peace of mind of knowing you've got the best deal for your family? That's what my family can do. By the way, go check out some of our reviews at ConradReviews.com. We've got an A-plus rating with the BBB, over a thousand five-star reviews, and an average score of 4.72 stars. We're helping families just like yours get out of debt faster and with cheaper monthly payments at SaveWithConrad.com. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Oh, and did I mention no house payments for two months? Give me a call, 888-425-0105, or send me an email personally, Conrad at SaveWithConrad.com. And let's get you saving some money right now at SaveWithConrad.com. Um... Brian wants to know, was Herb a kind person? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think anyone would, uh, he was fun to be. I mean, I don't know about his, uh, <laughs> philanthropic right. efforts or anything of that nature, but he was, a he was a genuinely nice human being. Yeah. Mitchell wants to know, Mick, where would you rank Herb in terms of professional wrestling personalities in regards to promoters <laughs> you've worked for? <laughs> So of all the promoters, oh, he had to have one of the craziest personalities. He was, yeah. I, you mean, you know, the bookers I were, I, Robert Fuller was such a great character, you know, and a wonderful storyteller and a very good booker. And there, Corny, of course, there's no one like Cornette. I worked for Paul Heyman, you know. I, like, I worked for some really good, Randy Hales was a good booker. But Herb was, if it's possible to be even more colorful than Corny, uh, because he had qualities that Jimmy, uh, I'm talking about the bad, the bad right. qualities that Corny did not have, but that were endearing nonetheless. Last but not least, Francis wants to know if you could sum up your time in the UWF, what would you say about it? Trying to come up with something equivalent to the time answer. It's going to be hard. I, I, I can't top that. It was a uh, one word answer stimulating. There you go. Stimulating. Yeah. I like it. Well, next week we got a stimulating topic. Paul Bearer. We'll be talking about Percy Pringle, your time with him in Dallas, your run against him and with him in the WWF, your real life relationship with him, and of course his legacy. You get all these shows early and ad-free over at adfreeshows.com. We're talking ad-free access to more than a dozen of your favorite wrestling podcasts. It starts at just $9 a month, and you can listen to them directly through your regular podcast app. And now, for the first time, you can enjoy the first week with us completely free. Sign up for a free trial and get a taste of what ad-free shows is all about at adfreeshows.com. There you'll also see our sit-down interview with Gary Juster. You've heard that name a lot, but maybe you've never heard a Gary Jester interview until now. Did Ad you Free know? Shows has it. Conrad, uh, when I was 19 years old and met promoter Tommy D at an independent show that was being run at my old high school, uh, I also met Paul Heyman. Really? Two of us, 19 years old. He's in the background of a photo I think I took with either Zabisco or Sergeant Slaughter, and Gary Jester was the promoter that night. That was that? March 1985. That's amazing, man. We've also got a new series over at adfreeshows.com with David Crockett called The Book. 
Uh, from the genius booking mind of Dusty Rhodes and the excellent penmanship of J.J. Dillon's handwriting, we've got Jimmy Crockett Jr.'s personal red books, and we break it down day by day, show by show, gate by gate, on the march to the very first WrestleMania where the Crockett's are actually going to buy back their old time slot. It's all available now at adfreeshows.com. By the way, if you're a business, Target's men 25 to 54 years old, no better place to advertise than right here with us on Foley is Pod. You've heard us do ads for some of the same companies for a long time. Why is that? Because it really works with our super targeted audience. There's very little waste. So go right now to advertisewithfoley.com to find out more about advertising here on Foley is Pod. It's advertisewithfoley.com. We made a reference. I got a little <coughs> concerned when you talk about JJ's uh, penmanship. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. So then I, you assured me it was not. It's not at your good. level. The Foley. The Sam, calligraphy. The thing is, I cannot write neatly as myself. Really? But as Santa. when the I magic kicks When out. I take on the duty as an ambassador. You transform. And the reason I have this letter, I won't tell you who it is. You'll have to find out. But one of the WWE superstars would only agree to the loan if I came through with the letter from Santa. So this would get a little, we won't uh, show the names, but here's a little bit of that Foley penmanship. penmanship. It's unbelievable. A little of the Foley penmanship. Dude, we, it's crazy. Pretty nice, right? I got to see one of these in person last year. <laughs> That's and right. I texted you right away. Like, it blew me away the amount of time. Oh, yeah, whose letter was it? Uh, someone in Tennessee. I don't know if, I don't, with, they're just north of Nashville. Okay, gotcha, yes. gotcha. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, and my goodness, to see it in person after hearing about it here on the program yeah. for a long time, it's another thing to hold it in your hand and realize, man, how much time and effort yeah. and energy went into this. Well, like, you want that, you know, there have been times over the years where even though I realize that I'm going to have my more eyeballs on something if I do a one-minute video, right? Uh, I'm thinking specifically about the letter, the article I wrote about Lex Luger called right. Reexamining Lex Luger, like, I wanted people to feel the effort. I wanted them to know that this was a four or five hour project because I think that that shows the level of commitment. And so I, uh, you know, the, ultimately the goal when I write one of these is that if I can get a, take a child who's on the fence and get that family one more year Right. And then sometimes introduce the child who is leaving the magic age into the idea of becoming a helper. There you go. And making Christmas as magical as possible for the brother or sister. Um, I wrote one letter, and I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it because uh, the parent was like, well, our oldest, you know, Caitlin doesn't believe. And I, so I said, I'm going to write a separate letter. I took a screenshot, so I'm not overstepping yes. uh, parental boundaries. Yeah. Um, Mother said, that's perfect. So she got a separate letter, and she the mother said she went up to her room and read it. And these things take about an hour each. So they're definitely, you can feel the level of commitment. And she came out and she said, Mom, I want to make Christmas as magical as possible for Matthew, and I'm trying to think of the other child's name. And it was so cool. So that Christmas Eve, I did a visit, and the oldest daughter met me outside and help me distribute the gifts. Wow. And the next day, uh, Christmas night, she said, that was the best Christmas of all. So that's the that's the best case scenario when you can help, you know, usher in a new era, you know, of, of appreciation for the holiday. And this all came about because Jill Thompson did a great illustration for me of Santa with a fountain pen looking over a... Um, a uh, a book. So I'll show you that cover page. I'll cover up the name. So this, is, but here's the, uh, there's the look. Wow. And I realized, well, I've got to, I've got to handwrite these. And when I started writing, my kids couldn't read my writing. So when I had my uh, hip hip surgery done and later my knee surgery in 2017. Uh, I was just working three, four, five hours a day on my handwriting. Wow. My wife would come up in the morning, she probably thought I was in a midlife crisis because there'd be a combination of Christmas song lyrics and love songs like all over the house. And I just think that, you know, if, if you want to get good at something, you work at it. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's one of the things I've done. It's become really a really invaluable part 
especially when you find out what a big deal it is to the yes. people who get the letters and there are people like Edge and Trish. And this is now seventeen. This is now their fifth year in a row getting the letters. And wow! It's a bad. Yeah, it's a. It's a really. It's a, my way of kind of giving back to uh, uh, the current. You know, the people, my contemporaries, but also the current generation who I didn't even really know that well. But they get that letter, and hopefully, like when they, what do you think about Mick Foley? Even if they weren't a fan of what I did in the ring, be like writes letters to my kids, right? you know, every every year. So I love that. I don't know why. So I don't doubt that J.J. had the great handwriting. And you'll see this is the only time I get territorial, right? Oh, listen, <laughs> there's no doubt that your calligraphy, that's what that is to me. I mean, that's art. But uh, a, a lot of times, as you've probably seen, some of these old booking oh, sheets just yeah. look like chicken scratch. Yeah. But with JJ, man, you can really tell exactly what it is. And it's nice, man. It's a great example of who you are, though, that you don't really half-ass anything, including cameo. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you put a lot of effort into cameo. You just celebrated your forty-fifth or, or forty-five hundred great reviews uh, by doing forty-five percent off. We're trying to get to five thousand, so you can yeah. run another promotion. But in the meantime, we're trying to reclaim your rightful spot. We are, yeah. and I will tell you. When does this? What's the air date here? Two weeks from the day. Okay. Uh, Third of March. Th- ah, okay. A week uh, as for three weeks, uh, the three weeks preceding this, 25% of the cameo, uh, my cameos have gone to a group called Choose Love, and they're helping out uh, victims of the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. Wow, that's awesome. So uh, yesterday I had a good, a good day on cameo. Someone ordered a business video. And so we're making, you know, every little bit helps. Um I'm reading the, just finished the Pam Anderson memoir, which I loved. What'd you think? I really, it, you know what it was? I watched the documentary. I did too. And she's so likable. Uh, I I did not realize, I don't think a lot of people realize that the tape that came out was something that was stolen from them. Yeah. And I like to think that not nearly as many people who enjoyed it would have had they known that. But still, she was such a force of nature. It was going they to would be have a, enjoyed it. They probably would have enjoyed it anyway. But when I watched the documentary, I thought, what a beautiful soul, yes. right? Like, uh, what a beautiful soul. And you realize, like, well, you think, why did this woman come under such terror scrutiny? Like, because she's gentle. She's an animal lover. Like, she cares about people around the world. And I just looked at the opportunity to read that book as an opportunity to spend some more time with someone that yes. I really grew to like during that documentary. It's written by her, no ghostwriter. Some of it's in verse. And it's very it's very sweet. It was the type of thing where as I'm finishing, I'm regretting that I have to finish. Oh, wow. Yeah. So That's a great I, song. I think it's, a, it's, it's really good. It's really sweet. And I, if, if, even if you, I was never a huge fan, right? Right. I knew her as that cultural phenomenon, and I've got that great photo uh, that we took, I think, in 2003 or 2004. But I highly recommend it. I really do. It's a, it's a really great book. Speaking of books, I know that a friend of ours has a book coming out real soon. Medusa has written yeah. a book, mm-hmm. and I think she's going to be signing those at WrestleCon, which I know you'll be at as mm-hmm. a part of Mickey James' event, uh, Dresselmania, and of course, most of those days, fans can stop by and get their Funko signed and yeah. all that jazz, but uh, I'm curious, since you're sort of the go-to guy, did you help Medusa take a look at her book? I, I was a pre-reader, so pre-reader, I always had a group of five or six people who read the book before it was uh, uh, taken to the editor, or maybe in conjunction with the editor, and so Jill Thompson, I mentioned her, the artist who did my uh uh, Santa stuff. She's so intuitive and so creative. She was always one of my pre-readers. Barry Blaustein was a pre-reader for some of my books. So I was one of Medusa's pre-readers. And as somebody who's done this quite a bit, you know, I could tell her, I really liked it. I love her honesty. It's a really, she's somebody who put everything she had into everything she did. Yes. It, whether it was uh, wrestling or monster trucks or raising <laughs> wolf puppies. Like she's had, or she was in, uh, she had, I don't know if she was a nurse or something close to a practitioner, but she's somebody who's put everything she has into everything she does. She's got a really unique story to tell, and uh, and I really enjoyed reading it. So check out Medusa's book, and be sure to check out Mick at WrestleCon. 
WrestleMania is happening as a little post-mania night one event back at the WrestleCon Hotel, the beautiful Biltmore Hotel. But I think most of those days you'll be signing autographs at WrestleCon. I'll be uh, there all four days. I'll be hosting uh, WrestleMania. I've got another kind of uh, um, variety show type of thing. I'm doing one of those nights where I'm, uh, you know, it's like an evening with where I'll tell a few stories, but I'll be interviewed. So it won't be the one-man show, but, sure. it'll, but it'll be a lot of fun, especially if you're in the area. And I also have events coming up in Lafayette, Louisiana, and Richmond, Virginia uh, in the weeks preceding uh, WrestleCon. Right, right after WrestleMania, you'll be back here in Huntsville doing a convention. That's right. Where can we keep up with all things Mick Oh, Foley? just go to uh, realmickfoley.com or the Linktree profile that's on my face. Everything... Real Mick Foley uh, is Facebook. Real Mick Foley is uh, Instagram. Instagram. And I think the link tree is on there. So then you can find out not just about where my events will be, but you can find out about uh, uh, becoming a, a member of the show. Sure. So there's a lot of things to learn. So I am off. I'm on my way to a foreign country. How about that? Canada. It counts, uh, <laughs> Counts kind of. Oh, did you, were you able to print out uh, my? Uh, I got you good to go uh, on your nice. way out. And uh, don't forget to hit that subscribe button on YouTube. It's Foley on YouTube.com. If you think we're having fun when you're listening, you got to watch. And speaking of watching, you need to watch out for all the new shirts over at FoleyIsPodShirts.com. We uh, we got something silly every single week, Mick. But today was maybe one of our silliest topics we'll ever do. We tried to honor Herb's memory as best we could and have a little fun, and I think you would have liked it I that way. I think we did. If I could find one of those Herbie cookies. Oh, man. Could you imagine? Uh, you know, you don't think Tim Jameson would want one of those hanging oh, on his Christmas would. tree? Yeah, Tim, we're singling you out. I'm going to try to find my Herbie cookie and sell it. Do you think he sprinkled cocaine in those? <laughs> these, these are made by Marge the Baker. And not Marge's those are her, oh, mean, and his own the cookies? OG ones back in the day. Do you oh, think oh, uh, maybe that was. Oh, let me just leave you. This is my final line. Okay, okay. Herb was dating a very enthusiastic young lady, and uh, he had the Mister Electricity T-shirt. And I asked his girlfriend. I said, well, "Why do Why do you call him Mister Electricity?" And she goes, "Because when he plugs it in, he turns me on." Mic drop. And on that note, we'll see you next week right here on Foley is Pod.